They say it's hard to lie about anything these days because we got receipts for all of you guys that said Joe didn't do anything wrong and WAC 100 is lying. I brought to you today a copy of the court transcripts from the lawsuit in 2016. That's right. We got receipts, baby. As you guys can see here, Liza Rios is listed as the plaintiff versus Joseph A. Cartagena and Jelly's Jams. Can you guys tell me who is Joseph A. Cartagena again? These court transcripts are from the last day in court, but two months prior, Joe did an interview declaring victory, saying, we've been in court for a year already. She's going to lose. When this is all over, you're going to see I won. Unfortunately, Joe was wrong. I know I saw something earlier today where she's allegedly suing because of Big Pun's royalties. She'll never win. Like, I mean, like, is 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 she'll never win because there's no truth to it. So, you know, we already in court for like a year or something, and I've proved in every way, you know, I'm going to win. Yeah. So I'm going to, so in, uh, whenever it's over, you're going to hear breaking news. He won. And of he don't course. owe her nothing. He never took nothing. He did, right. So that, did, I lose no sleep over that. Right. On page 11, the judge says, I don't want to play semantics with it. I want to understand your argument and get past this. I'm not debating this with you, but you are not saying administer the copyright for the plaintiff. Mr. Kaplan, who is Jelly Bean's lawyer, says it is administering the copyright for Mr. Cartagena's company. The judge says, no, it is for your benefit. You are the only one benefiting. You are using the copyright. You are not administering the copyright. Mr. Kaplan says we are administering. The judge says you are using it for your benefit to profit. Mr. Kaplan says we have a payment obligation to Cartagena. We don't have a payment obligation to the plaintiff. The judge says, so you are not doing anything for the plaintiff. Mr. Kaplan says, well, in theory, page 13, the judge says, all right, so you have a contract with the plaintiff. What is your obligation under the contract with the plaintiff? What are you supposed to do for the plaintiff? Mr. Kaplan says to pay all monies with respect to the commercial exploitation of the copyright to Cartagena, not to the plaintiff. The court says, and that's all that you have to do? Mr. Kaplan says, correct. So right here, the lawyer is clearly dancing around. They only have an obligation to pay Joe, and Joe has to split the funds with Pun's family. The judge is getting on the lawyer's ass here, man, basically saying, how are you being able to collect money for the copyrights and take a cut, but you have no obligation to Pun's family to give them the money? And the lawyer is arguing, well, technically, we are, but it's Joe that's doing it, so if Joe gets paid, they get paid. And there is so much to read, guys. Like, I mean, we're talking over 50 pages, so I'm just highlighting the key moments in this. Page 14, the judge says, so why is that a contract? I have never heard of a contract where one party says, I have rights, but I have no obligations. There is supposed to be consideration in a contract. What is the consideration that's being exchanged here if it's a contract between you and the plaintiff? That's all I'm asking. Mr. Kaplan says, the consideration is that we are commercially exploiting the copyright, your honor. The judge says, for whose purpose? When you say commercially exploiting, that's not to the plaintiff's benefit. That's to your benefit. Mr. Kaplan says, it is to the plaintiff's benefit if we pay monies over to Cartagena. And the judge interrupts and says, no, the plaintiff didn't sign a contract with you saying, well, the only thing you have to do is exploit the copyright. That's your obligation to me. That's not the consideration that you are giving the plaintiff. That's the benefit that you are getting from it right that's your right that you get that's the benefit see even the judge right here is like make it make sense how is this even a thing that you are not even responsible to do anything for puns family but you're collecting money page 15 the judge says the total consideration is that while you were exploiting the copyright for your benefit, you would make payments. I'll articulate it the way you say it. You would make payments to Cartagena. Mr. Kaplan says that's pursuant to the agreement we had with Cartagena. The judge says, well, it's pursuant to the agreement you had with the plaintiff too, right? You say you didn't have the obligation to pay it directly to the plaintiff. You had the obligation to pay it to Cartagena. Mr. Kaplan says there is no payment obligation, your honor, in the letter of inducement. It is not there. It is a primary contract with Cartagena. The judge says, how could you even breach the contract? You are saying you could do whatever you want. You could steal the money if you wanted. You have no obligations under the contract. There is no way you could breach this contract. That's your argument. Regardless of what you did, there is absolutely no way you could breach this contract. 
Mr. Kaplan says, because there is no obligations running from us to the plaintiff. The judge says, then there isn't a contract. Then you don't have a contract with the plaintiff. There is no such thing as a contract that doesn't have both rights and obligations. Mr. Kaplan, your honor, the, the judge interrupts. It may be a gift, but that's not a contract. Mr. Kaplan responds and says the letter of inducement was supported by consideration in the monies that were paid to Cartagena and split with the plaintiff. The judge responds and says, yeah, but the letter of inducement is not something that you can enforce unless you have a contract with the plaintiff. It is something that they can enforce, right? Mr. Kaplan responds and says, no, in the letter of inducement, they are agreeing to be bound by the terms of our agreement. The judge says, and what are you agreeing to? Nothing. Mr. Kaplan responds and says, we have agreed to pay Cartagena for, the judge says, you agreed to pay Cartagena, right? Mr. Kaplan responds and says, right, and Cartagena agreed to pay the plaintiff. This part is really crazy because the judge is aware that no matter what Jelly Bean does, there's no way to breach the contract. He could do whatever he wanted and still collect funds. There's a common theme here. I hope y'all are catching on. Page 22, Mr. Kaplan says, the answer is that we make a commitment to pay Cartagena. Cartagena has certain obligations to the plaintiff, but the plaintiff has acknowledged that even if Cartagena breached, they couldn't get out of what they have given us. Page 23, Mr. Kaplan says, but we are not guaranteeing those obligations. We say that the plaintiff has to look to Cartagena for fulfillment of any of those obligations. Page 29, the judge says, I'm not sure then tell me, articulate for me in light of this discussion, what is the proper declaratory judgment against Jelly's Jams? Miss Rosario, who is Liza Rio's lawyer says, because of the breach of the contract. The judge says, by Miss Rosario says, by defendant Fat Joe, the court has already ruled that there is no direct obligation to make royalty payments by Jelly's Jam to the plaintiff. So the obligation for whatever money is owed is money that's owed by defendant Fat Joe Cartagena. And so in light of that, if there has been a failure to pay an account, then that's the basis for a material breach of contract. Your Honor, the discovery in this case has clearly shown several material breaches of contract. Page 37, the judge says, so how does a declaratory judgment against Jelly's Jams affect that? Ms. Rosario says he would no longer be able Able to collect my client's money and she could collect her money herself since he has an inability to turn the money over. The judge says, all right, so you are not seeking any monetary judgment from Jelly's Jam. Ms. Rosario says, no, the monetary damages are due from defendant Cartagena. The judge says, you simply are seeking a declaratory judgment that indicates that Jelly's Jams no longer has the right to collect the royalties. Ms. Rosario says, correct, exactly, exactly. Liza's lawyer confirms that the money not being paid is Fat Joe's fault and not Jelly Bean's fault but they are trying to get out of the contract with Jelly Bean so then Liza can collect the copyright money herself and not have to use the services of Jelly Bean. Page 40 Miss Rosario says well your honor at this juncture as I'm sure you know the well you may not know the plaintiff's expert submitted a report saying there was two million in royalties owed because there was an analysis back to the inception of the agreement based upon the fact that the royalty statements were not delivered to the plaintiff. So the two year cutoff period that they want to refer to is an operative because the documents were only produced and in fact the original statements going back to 1998 were only ever produced in connection with this lawsuit. They were never delivered to the decedent nor to the plaintiff. So our position is that the royalties carry forward. The balance carries forward all the way until the present. Defendant Jelly's Jams in producing copies of the statements or producing the statements in discovery made an adjustment of 250 58,000 that they claim goes all the way back to 2005. So the plaintiff's position is that there is a basis for a complete recalculation of this entire royalty account to determine the amount that's actually due. Because even given the six year statute of limitations, the balance carries forward because there is no way to adequately determine what the royalties would have been just looking at the six year period. So there is a six year statute of limitations on breach of accounting. And what they're arguing is that the statements for the royalties have been messed with to make it seem like pun is unrecouped, unrecouped from the advances. So they cannot collect any money from the royalties because they're still paying it back. But the problem is because the statements have been messed with, they don't truly know how much is really owed to them. Because if you just go back six years, 
that amount that is claimed to be the balance may not be true because if you go back to the very beginning, then you can really calculate how much has been messed up. You can calculate then how much is truly owed to them. And then when they did the forensics investigation, they saw that they were owed over $2 million. So what happened was by the end of the court day, Joe and Jelly Bean was looking so bad that the judge even advised them to settle this outside of court. And they knew that if it went to trial, they were going to lose. So they agreed to try to work things outside of court. And three months later, Liza had the option to either collect $2 million and keep Joe on as a partner or take less money and get the catalog. And Joe would no longer be involved. She chose the catalog and less money so Joe would no longer longer have a say in anything pun related now if you take anything away from this it's that even the lawyer for his own co-defendant jelly bean was saying that they paid joe the funds and joe was supposed to split half of what he was paid with liza and so it fell on joe if liza wasn't getting her cut so y'all let me know what y'all think about this man put your thoughts down in the comments and make sure you like and subscribe and stay connected with panda chop news peace